Uh, welcome everyone. Um, I'm happy to have you here today for the second in this year's LIR series of the Carol D'Onofrio Lectures in Public Health. I'm very pleased to introduce today a colleague whom I've known for many years through a family connection since her sister is married to my brother. Today I look forward to the first occasion on which I see her scholarly side. I was especially happy to include her in this series because her research interests align very closely with those of Carol D'Onofrio and she will in fact have a few words to say about Carol as a preface to her presentation. Meredith Minkler is now a professor of the Graduate School and Professor Emerita of Public Health and Social Behavior. She's a native of the Bay Area and received her BA in Social Science and her Master and Doctorate of Public Health at Berkeley. Went on to pursue her whole career here in the School of Public Health, as well as being for some years an adjunct professor at the UCSF Institute for Healthing, Health and Aging. She was the founding director of Berkeley's own Center on Aging. Her research has touched on many aspects of aging and on several forms of community-based research, both in the US and abroad. This research reflects a commitment to seeking to improve health and environment for those who have, for various social, economic, and racial reasons, limited access to essential health services or the infrastructure of living a healthy life. She has co-authored, uh, authored, co -authored, authored, or edited several books that are staples of public health education. One of these is Community-Based Participatory Research for Health, for which she recently completed revisions for the forthcoming third edition. Uh, another is a book she edited, another book she edited also in its third edition is Community Organizing and <clears throat> uh, Community Building for Health and Welfare. And many of you may remember hearing about a her 1993 book co-authored with Kay Rowe, Grandmothers as Caregivers, Raising the Children of the Crack Cocaine Epidemic. In addition, she is the author of over 125 chapters in refereed books and over 150 refereed articles. The list of her consultancies, committee service, and grants in connection with her research areas is a long one, as is that of the honor she has won for this work. In several different roles, she has been a campus leader in promoting community service and academic service learning. Without further ado then, let me now turn the screen over to Professor Minkler to tell us something about Carol D'Onofrio and then to her topic, improving the relevance, rigor, and reach of research through engaging communities, case studies from the San Francisco and Chinatown and Tenderloin neighborhoods. Take it away. Thank you so much, Dom, uh, sorry, Dr. Mastronardi, for that lovely introduction and for your leadership of the entire center and particularly by the way you pulled together this special LIR series in honor of our friend and colleague, Carol D'Onofrio. Uh, Carol, um, I know for many of you, is known for her leadership of and love for the center, and prior to that, her work with the Academic Senate. But for me, Carol was always first and foremost an outstanding uh, teacher and mentor. Uh, her uh, love of teaching and learning her boundless curiosity, her intelligence and intellect and her infectious laughter, and finally the pride she took in her students and junior colleagues and particularly in her own two children are things that will stay with me always. Well, I'm delighted to be able to talk with you today about an approach to research that Carol also believed in. Um, let's see how to do but I am very happy to talk with you about improving research, not only its relevance, but also its rigor and its reach, its ability to really make large scale change through engaging communities. And uh, as Donna mentioned, I'll be using two case studies, one from Chinatown and one from San Francisco's Tenderloin neighborhood. The rationale for engaging communities in research is I think best captured in this cartoon because there is a huge disconnect between the kinds of things we as academics are interested in, worried about, want to study, and the real concerns of people in their neighborhoods. If we're going to do authentic engagement, though, we need to change our vision of community, particularly in fields like public health and medicine. We need to get away from a deficit mentality where we look at communities as a bundle of pathologies and instead focus on developing an epidemiology of strengths where we look for and help build community assets and only then look at the problems they're concerned about and how we can help uh, address them. Community-based participatory research goes by many names, but the basic idea is that it is a collaborative, 
collaborative effort among community, academic, and other partners who gather and use research and data to build on community strengths and to work on the priorities of the community for multi-level strategies to improve health and social equity. Most important perhaps is what's not in the definition, but as you see below, it's not a research method at all. It is an orientation to research that reflects a conscious commitment to changing the power relationship between the researcher and the research. There's a very strong evidence base now in support of CEPR. Uh, we've got systematic reviews and meta-analyses of the health and social outcomes of this work. We have some randomized control trials, uh, NIH, CDC, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and other major funders now welcome and encourage this approach, and they sometimes mandate it because they know that if we're working on sensitive topics, we're not likely to get far if we use a top-down, outside expert-driven approach to the work. Most of the major journals in medicine and public health now do uh, accept, often encourage, sometimes have whole theme issues on participatory research. And finally, Sir Michael Marmot, who's a graduate of our School of Public Health, and widely regarded as the top social epidemiologist in the world, uh, he has really come around as a hard scientist, uh, pointing out that a good idea is harder to come by than more data. And as an example, he pointed out that when he was going to do a study of uh, older women, he wanted to get a better uh, way of measuring income adequacy. And so he asked older women, and their response was having enough money to buy presents for your grandchildren. Uh, I've used uh, approaches like that as well, and I can tell you that responses you get are much more, much richer, um, much more meaningful than if you simply ask, is your income adequate to meet your needs? Well, these are the principles of community-engaged research. I've already talked about them, except the bottom one that we commit for the long haul to enable sustainability, and I'm going to illustrate that with both of the case studies. The only uh, issue that's missing, I think, is that community engagement involves really embodying cultural humility so that we can never be competent in another another's culture, but we can show a real commitment to uh, looking at our own biases and assumptions, really trying to understand others' cultures, working to address power imbalances, and to develop respectful, uh, authentic partnerships with communities. Cultural humility is particularly important because of the lack of trust of outside researchers that, as you probably know, goes back to uh, the Tuskegee experiment in the United States and numerous other examples, particularly in Black, Brown, and Indigenous communities, all of whom have had some very bad experiences with researchers often in the name of public health or medicine. Uh, in Indian country, they refer to the traditional approach as parasite re sorry, parachute research, where you, you know, jump into the community, take what you need and leave, and don't leave anything behind for the community. The Alaska Native saying is researchers are like mosquitoes. They suck your blood and leave. And that is just a reminder of some of the reasons why in the era of COVID-19, so many people of color were reluctant to get the vaccine and it was lack of trust in the system, in the medical care, in science. And this is something that is really a life and death matter that we have to deal with. Well, obviously when you're engaging community, it can uh, occur along a continuum. Uh, at the low end, you can, for example, hire uh, Latinas as promotores de salud, health promoters, who can uh, try to get more women in their rich networks and communities to uh, take part in a clinical trial on a breast cancer approach or uh, be involved in an intervention to increase the uptake of, of COVID shots. Um, but if that's all we do, we miss so much of the opportunity to really have community members inform and improve the research we do and improve the possibility of leveraging the results for 
uh, promoting change, not just getting publications, but making real change on the community through the policy level. So let me turn to the first case study. This is the longer of the two, um, and it is one that uh, I have been just immensely pleased about being involved with. As you all know, we think about Chinatown, many of us have this vision of, uh, you know, the beautiful streets and the, all the decorations. And it is the cultural hub of the immigrant Chinese community and obviously a major tourist attraction. It's also the most dense uh, population of the community in San Francisco. Most all of the residents are monolingual Chinese. And what people don't see or don't recognize is that two thirds of the residents are very poor. They're living in single room occupancy hotels. 30% uh, were below poverty line even before the pandemic. And that has, of course, become much worse. And before the pandemic, also, uh, close to all of the working age people were, in fact, working mostly in restaurants. And that was, of course, one of the industry's hardest hit by the pandemic. Well, this study uh, began long before the recent history. It began in 2007 in the most wonderful possible way. The Chinese Progressive Association, which is a highly respected organization working on behalf of tenants and workers in Chinatown, contacted the school's labor occupational health program because they knew someone there. She was Chinese. She had deep roots in Chinatown. And they said, we really want to do a study of health and safety in our community, but we wanna make it strong. So we wanna do it with the university. Uh, can you help us? Well, Pam got in touch with me. We got in touch with an occupational health physician at UCSF who has a wonderful track record of working with communities and with the Department of Public Health. And then went as a group of five or six over to Chinatown to meet with members of the uh, CPA to talk further about what they wanted. And I should mention that probably the most important part of this partnership, the most important partner was the worker partners, the restaurant workers who we hired and trained and who were active in every stage of the process. Uh, we had to hire them a little later, but even in the beginning, they were giving us their input through the CPA and it greatly improved uh, even knowing what to study. For example, uh, we uh, outsiders, public health people, when we were told they wanted a study on health and safety, thought, well, we know all about that. And we know that restaurants employ a third of all the Chinese immigrant workers in Chinatowns all over the country. And we know they have some of the highest uh, rates of non-fatal illnesses and injuries. So we know the problem. And they said, well, those things are important, but our biggest health problem is wage theft. And they went on to say, um, we work two or three months without getting paid. Then we ask the boss if we can get our money and he or she says, well, you can wait a few weeks or you can quit now because there's plenty more where you come from. They told us about workers not uncommonly being called in early from their breaks if they were non-smokers. And so some of them would would uh, pretend to be smokers and carry cigarettes just to get a full break. Well, given this information, we uh, worked as a collective to reframe a study that was based on the standard uh, ways of studying restaurant worker health and safety. And we included a large component on wage theft. We did a survey on the individual level of 433 restaurant workers on the restaurant level. Uh, we were able to do through the health department an observational checklist of health and safety and wage theft from a worker rather than a customer perspective. Uh, we looked at healthcare access and at policy factors, including uh, the enforcement and creation of potential new policies with regard to wage theft. The workers went through an eight week training for their roles in the study. Um, they uh, here are role playing, uh, how you safely and ethically recruit people for participation in a study. They learn to do risk mapping. All of the sample uh, items, studies, items we were using, the survey, the observational checklist, 
we showed those first to the worker partners and got their input and they made really important corrections and uh, fixed cultural inaccuracies, et cetera. They learned about data interpretation and about use of findings to make change. I'm just gonna give you a few examples of their contributions to improving the quality and rigor of the research. For example, this is the first page of a, of a standard health and safety restaurant worker study that the government uh, put together. And as you can see, they have all these categories of work in the restaurant. The worker partners looked at it and said, well, these are important, but what about the leafleters who are out in front, you know, day after day, they're, they're giving away dim sum coupons. Their employees too, you need to include them. So we did. They helped us identify very difficult to, con to translate concepts, including this one on a validated scale. This is a common uh, scale for measuring depression and anxiety. And the worker partners were looking at it in Chinese and suddenly started laughing. And we said, what's so funny? And they said, what does it mean butterflies in your stomach? Well, we tried to explain, started laughing ourselves. It's such a ridiculous idiom. And uh, they said, take it out. And we said, well, we can do that. But this is a validated scale. You want a strong study. And if you want to be able to compare your findings of those that the CPA in New York or Boston or Los Angeles might do, uh, the validated scale should probably stay intact. And they said, well, then what else can we do? Could we have a phrase underneath this explaining what it means? And we decided that was perfectly kosher. So that is how it was addressed. The worker partners were also terribly important in getting us an exact number of restaurants. I had asked the head of the, the <clears throat> appropriate unit, excuse me, in the Department of Public Health, uh, how many restaurants are we talking about here? And he said, well, between 80 and 120. Well, that kind of vague figure is not gonna cut it if you're doing a research. So <clears throat> the worker partners took a map of Chinatown, they broke it into uh, sectors, they went in pairs, covered the entire uh, 20 block, 20 square blocks, and were able to indicate all of the restaurants that existed were open and came up with an exact number uh, of 108. And that's what we use throughout the study. They also really helped improve the restaurant observational checklist that I mentioned earlier. For example, the 16 item uh, draft instruction checklist included an item, is the first aid kit visible? And they said, well, that's good, it's visible, but could you ask if it's fully stocked? Because usually they only have band-aids and maybe some cream. So we changed it. They said, are the posters visible where workers can read them, paid sick leave, minimum wage? And they said, well, they're visible, but we can't read them because they're not in Chinese. So with these corrections, the final instrument was much more relevant and, and useful, and it was, uh, in, it was used in all but two of the Chinatown restaurants. Human subjects, as I mentioned, uh, we spent a lot of time helping the worker partners understand human subjects, the rationale, and how to appropriately and ethically ask participants if they want to, people if they want to take part. But what they could share was how to safely recruit and, and interview people away from the restaurants. So they said, these are the SROs where most of the restaurant workers live. Those are good places to go into and we can go in there. Uh, they talked about some pastry shops where the workers go after work and where bosses never show up. They talked about a popular park where workers go on their day off. And through all of those venues and through their great relationships with uh, fellow restaurant workers, they and the 17 additional restaurant workers that we hired and trained as interviewers were able to conduct, as I said, 433 interviews. We told CDC we hoped to get 300. That was a ridiculous figure we figured, but in fact, uh, they did an amazing job and every month or so they would report back to the full group and we tried to be the ones wearing the headphones for simultaneous translation and i thought that was a way of showing cultural humility when we're the minority in this situation 
Uh, we, after the first 150 surveys were done, really wanted to say thank you to these workers. And so we asked them, what, what would you like? What can we do uh, to kind of celebrate you? And they said, we thought they were gonna wanna have dinner in a fancy restaurant. And they said, oh no, we wanna be outside San Francisco. We wanna be at a beach. One of the women said, I haven't been out of San Francisco in 13 years. So we uh, made this possible and only the Chinese, Chinese speaking members of our group attended because we wanted to make a fully fun, no translation kind of event. Well, I just put here uh, the main, some of the main findings about wage theft, which were very much what we expected, uh, close to 60% having experienced this, 70% of kitchen workers not getting minimum wage, the lunch break interruptions, particularly for smokers. But the one that didn't make sense was this last one, that 40% didn't get mandated paid sick leave. Well, if that's true, it means the majority are getting paid sick leave, which if they're not getting minimum wage, doesn't really compute. So we would work with the uh, worker partners in small groups talking about the different questions and, and the responses and making sure we had it right. And on this one, we said, what do workers mean when they say uh, that they have paid sick leave? What does that mean? And they said, oh, that's when you're sick, so you stay home for a day. And then you come back and work the next day for free. Well, if we had published our finding without their input, we, of course, would have been dead wrong. I want to move quickly to the, uh, the final action stage of this project. Um, you probably all know the saying that laws are like sausages. It's better not to see them being made. In this case, in CBPR, we want to not only see them be made, but get our hands dirty. You want to be in the mix. And I like to use with community partners the simple uh, three streams in the policy making process. So, model that talks first about convincing decision makers that a problem exists, then in the politics stream about coming up with politically attractive solutions, often those don't cost much money and that's why they're attractive. And finally, in the policy stream, negotiating the politics to get the approval of your proposal. When positive developments in call occur in all three of these streams, you're likely to see a, a window of opportunity when change is most likely, a policy is most likely to pass. Well, in the policies, in the problem stream, the uh, CPA partnered with an organization that's very good at taking research, both hard data and qualitative, and putting it into these beautiful reports uh, this one we printed in three languages, and it really laid out in accessible terms, both for community and for policymakers, what we had found and recommendations for change. The report was launched at a community event that was attended by over 200 attendees, over 200 residents and other people. There were 50, 20 people that I counted from various media outlets Four of these 11 supervisors were there, which says something, and the heads of some of the agencies in city government, including DPH. We then used media advocacy uh, to our advantage because, of, because the media had been invited to that event. Uh, that night, there were studies on the night that there were programs on the nightly news about this uh, development and a wage step, a terrible problem of wage step in Chinatown, uh, front page news in the Chronicle and Examiner the next day, and in the major uh, Chinese uh, newspaper in Northern California. At the same time, we had started working with uh, Supervisor Eric Marr, who was a, a champion of the, the uh, worker community, and he really responded when he heard uh, what had been uncovered in this study and said that he was going to introduce legislation drawn from action research and organizing to help uh, basically ban wage theft in San Francisco. Well, in order to convince all of the supervisors and uh, the government and city at large that this was a broad problem, we had to broaden the base. So the CPA created a Progressive Workers Alliance and when it was time to uh, announce the measure, 
uh, workers across sectors showed up at City Hall. So you had youth workers, domestic workers, LGBT workers, unions, all showing up, speaking at, hear at hearings, and um, letting it be known that this mattered broadly in the city. We also continued base building and also policy advocacy, both working with the mayor, but also looking at some of the opponents uh, to the, their work and trying to talk with them and see how we could uh, figure out what their objections were and what we could do about them. Well, the wage theft ordinance was signed into law in, uh, in September of 2011. And the next month, an enforcement measure was passed. And I can't straight enough how important this is because typically uh, ordinances don't have enforcement and they don't have teeth, they just look good. In this case, we have the option of then making sure that this uh, bill had teeth and was going to do something. And it did. Uh, the first uh, wage theft victory came in uh, February 2013, over half a million dollars to restaurant workers who were in a restaurant that paid four hours, four dollars an hour. We had two victories in uh, 2014, over a million dollars. This one, the biggest, in a Michelin rated restaurant where 280 restaurants, uh, restaurant workers had a win of $4 million. When you do the math and you realize how badly those workers had been ripped off if they were getting $4 million in compensation. There were continued roles for the academic and public health partners throughout this process. So the Department of Public Health was monitoring information about different forms of wage theft. They were looking at different labor policies that were related to that problem. They were monitoring compliance. And uh, the rest of us were continuing to support CPA and building community capacity and doing some of the organizing uh, that they wanted to do. With the pandemic, there was, of course, a major pivot. CPA uh, had to put a heavy focus, as it should, on direct aid for residents. They advocated for and got a $2 million relief package to Chinese restaurants. And this was phenomenal because the restaurants were able to prepare meals for seniors and SRO residents. Uh, and they also were local leaders in the fight against Asian and AAPI hate crimes and quickly linked their work on that issue with Black Lives Matter. More wage theft wins, wins took place during the pandemic though and CPA is now recognized as a, if not the national leader of the wage theft movement in the United States. Now, staying engaged for the long haul in this study meant that when the funding ran out in 2010, we didn't go anywhere. We continued having monthly meetings of the full partnership. By staying engaged, we outside partners could provide testimony when it was needed. We could follow up with monitoring and evaluation of outcomes. Two of our uh, UC Berkeley members became respectively uh, a member of the board of the CPA and the chair of the board. And we, of course, co-authored publications and uh, brought community members with us uh, to national and local meetings to talk about their role in the work. We're reflecting back on these victories. Uh, the CPA executive director said that the research armed us with the documentation of the community's reality. That was an untold story. The statistics we needed to get policymakers attention. That information became a key part of the campaign to end wage theft. Well, I have gone over. Let me talk very quickly uh, about a, another uh, air project I've been involved in for uh, close to 10 years now in the Tenderloin in an effort to address food insecurity. This is an example of a multi-intervention research uh, where the idea is to intervene at, at least three levels of the ecological model. Uh, you're trying to affect change both on those levels and between them because we know you get higher impact that way. And for health equity, you put a heavy accent at each level on the social determinants of health that create and maintain inequities. Uh, I think you all know the context of this work. The tenderloin has been in the news uh, daily for months and months, uh, mostly for homelessness and drug addiction. But 
horrific problems that those both constitute. Um, but food security is also a major and largely overlooked problem. In uh, 2013, when I first joined the project, there were 73 corner stores in the Tenderloin, and this is what they looked like inside. Uh, not a single full-serve grocery store and the highest density of tobacco outlets anywhere in the city. Well, the catalyst for change came from a group of Vietnamese youth who were sick and tired of walking home trying to go into a store and get an apple or something healthy to eat, nothing available. And so they spoke to the Vietnamese Youth Development Center that they uh, went to after school and, and they talked about their desire to really study, uh, get a sense of these, um, these corner stores and then put together some visual that would get people's attention and they even could get things changed. Well, their Apple map, which as you can see, uh, rate stores from a good apple, of which there were two, uh, to half an apple to a rotten apple, which, of which there were most. And the map was, was very compelling. Uh, they uh, had managed to get into 35 of the 70 stores, so that was a big deal too. And they shared the map with the Community Benefits District, with public health, with local nonprofits, who began meeting and realizing we've got to do something about this. Um, and they uh, had a lot of things they were going to consider, different avenues for uh, doing something. But it turned out that everybody in the room was most excited about converting the corner stores from a negative to an asset in this community. As in the uh, Chinatown, you know, you had a, a number of groups that came together to form this collaboration. Uh, and the most important people of all, it turned out, was were the residents who were hired and trained. They were given a livable wage. They were trained in all the things they needed to know, nutrition and health, tobacco industry tactics, human subjects, and different research methods. And they were chosen for their strong relationships with merchants. And as a result, they made possible the, all the research and the action that led up to the kind of change we were hoping to see. Uh, these are the four original food justice leaders. They are in a store outside the Tenderloin where they practiced using this, uh, sorry, this instrument. This is a standardized tool for corner store assessments. It's actually uh, lengthy and, and quite uh, detailed. And again, because of their good relationships with merchants, the food justice leaders got to do this assessment in two thirds of all the Tenderloin stores. The DPH and UC Berkeley helped with trainings and did things like comparison ratings uh, and data entry checks to ensure the reliability and veracity of the data. And then the findings were put together first, not in a publication, but in a healthy shopping guide that could be given out to residents throughout the community. This was the launch of the uh, shopping guide uh, it, it was given out right after there was one-on-one -on -one, uh, talk with merchants about their scores, what they could do to improve, um, other information they needed. But the fact that three supervisors showed up at this launch was again indicative of the fact that they knew there was a problem and they were interested in working with the community to find a solution. Well, media advocacy, again, was used here to increase awareness of the problem uh, when Supervisor Marr, uh, one of the three supervisors on this project that was helpful, uh, wanted, he, when, he, when he saw the Apple map and when he heard uh, about the state of the stores from people at that uh, launch, he asked for a walking tour of the corner stores and one of the uh, food justice leaders happily provided that. And he came away saying, I've really seen healthy food access is a civil rights issue. Well, with the media advocacy the, uh, and, and really positive feedback from a lot of key people in uh, the city, the partnership, the coalition and the other partners started envisioning what a healthy retail program would look like. And their idea was, let's get a city ordinance that doesn't punish corner stores for doing bad things, but incentivizes the ones who want to do good things. So if they will, for example, donate, donate at least 35% to 
of their selling space to healthy food. Uh, if they will have no more than 20% of their space donated to alcohol and tobacco, and if they'll pay minimum wage, let's give them things like a makeover, uh, a store makeover, discount appliances, a lot of city services, and a store launch that will really put them on the map for people in the neighborhood. Well, obviously the devil's in the details, a lot of additional work had to go on before that program uh, could even become um, a, a possibility of introducing as an ordinance. And then once it was introduced and a vote was coming up, more media advocacy and also testifying at meetings. And it was wonderful that we had food justice leaders, we had people from the Tenderloin, from the Bayview Hunters Point, uh, a couple of us academics would testify and the uh, people from the health department. So they got a lot of information, both at a land use hearing and then at the full board meeting, and they voted unanimously to pass this measure. Well, the coalition then immediately uh, went into high gear because they were in charge of everything from merchant applications for the program to store selection to redesign and to the grand reopenings that took place for each store. Um, I just wanted to show you some before after pictures so you can visualize this. Uh, Radman's was the first store to convert and you can see how different the store looks after this renovation has taken place. Here's another one, Friendly Liquor Market, which thankfully took liquor out of its title. Um, and they were pleased to get veggie vouchers from the city that, that go to residents for use in healthy retail stores. So a lot of perks for these stores. Dalda's before and after, this was perhaps our biggest success story because Dalda's went back and did two other tiers of renovation. And I believe they are close to becoming the first full serve uh, grocery store in the Tenderloin. Uh, sorry for the blurry slide, but I did want you to see what the grand reopening events looked like, uh, serving uh, tasty food made with ingredients sold in the store, having games and ribbon cuttings and all the bells and whistles, uh, really very exciting events. But the question, of course, is whether these stores would continue to do what they agreed to do once all the attention was off of them. So we didn't let the attention be off them. The, the, uh, food justice leaders would go every other week to visit the stores with a quote report card and they'd look at their adherence to the store's individual development plan. So if they'd promised to take down certain uh, tobacco or alcohol ads in the front window and haven't done it, the workers would talk to them, the food justice leaders would talk to them about this and make sure they were going to do it and then go back and follow up. Well, for us as researchers, uh, one of the big things was to assess changes. We first wanted to see what was happening to sales of healthy and unhealthy products in the healthy retail stores themselves. So one requirement of being a healthy retailer was that the stores be willing to collect and give up point of sale data. Uh, every month, this was collected by the food justice leaders first a month before the conversion. So we have baseline data and then monthly every, every month going forward. And uh, the, the most important thing for the store owners was finding out whether their, their total sales had improved because if the uh, fruits and vegetables were selling and the skim milk, but their sales were down, they didn't wanna stay in the program. Well, here's the first nine months um, of the combined total sales for the first few stores. And as you can see, significant improvement in their sales. Total produce sales of, uh, of uh, produce um, in the first two years, 36% increase in the number of produce units sold every month. This is a wildly crazy slide, um, but it does show change in produce units sold over the first three years. And we know this is an underestimate due to some of the problems with baseline in the first two stores. Uh, tobacco sales dropped in the healthy retail stores. Uh, and uh, for me, the most important thing was, was there a ripple effect? Um, were the stores that were not healthy retailers doing anything to change the way they did business? 
so that they too were improving and becoming healthier uh, neighborhood assets. And sure enough, when we continue to collect the assessment data every year in the neighborhood from 56 and then uh, 59 of the neighborhood stores, um, we saw this change very clearly. In the beginning, at baseline, uh, half the stores had one star rating. They were poor. Uh, and by the end, by 2015, uh, you can see almost all of them were getting a good or an excellent rating. And by 2017, all were in that category. So uh, really an effective um, intervention, I think. And I want to end with this slide on the coalition growth and expansion. Uh, the Healthy Corner Store Coalition has taken Tenderloin out of its name because it was asked by the city to work in all the other food insecure neighborhoods in San Francisco as well. They got increased funding from the soda tax that passed and that they had helped to advocate for. They did new work on things like uh, access to cooking facilities if you live in a SRO and can't cook in your room or in your hotel, uh, access to healthy, low-cost restaurants in the neighborhood, and of course, continuing to address food insecurity, one corner store at a time. Okay, well, it's, uh, oh boy, we're, yeah, we're getting close to time for questions and answers, so let me just um, uh, end with some of the challenges in community-engaged research, and then why I think it's worth doing this work. Uh, first of all, anytime we engage communities, it's going to be time consuming and resource consuming. And we need to be aware of that up front and be okay with that. Uh, what I've done in both these studies was write separate grants to a separate uh, organization, a foundation that was willing to give a sizable grant to commu the community partners so that in addition to what they got, from our grant, they would get other money as well for their community capacity building. The enormous privilege we outsiders carry when we go into a community partnership and the insider-outsider tensions that can result from that uh, can be very problematic. Leadership training, as Paula Freire pointed out decades ago, can make community partners strangers in their own communities. And I know in the Chinatown study, some of the uh, worker partners in the beginning said, you know, I have to keep my face, my face down. Uh, my family doesn't want to know that I'm being an activist or that I'm studying problems in the corner stores. We're, we're undocumented. They're scared. Finally, from a methodological point of view, tailoring interventions to particular communities reduces generalizability. And on the other hand, it does relate better to typical circumstances than artificially controlled settings. And that's our response to people who say, oh, you've ruined your chances of having this study generalized on. Finally, the IRB, the Institutional Review Board system was never designed with community-based research in mind. They don't like it. They don't like to oversee community partners. They don't want us to continue having contact as a partnership. And because of their concerns, uh, these projects often take a long time to get through uh, IRB clearance. The Chinatown project took a year. And that was very hard to explain to our community partners and worker partners. Uh, a late stage HIV study that I did uh, in um, Oakland with uh, community partners took nine months. This is just typical. And I think we do have uh, the onus on us to educate IRBs, to share with them some of the things that other places are doing to make this process more conducive to the review of community engaged research. Well, is it worth the challenge? I wanna end with two quotes. This one comes from two physicians who said, community members will bring new perspectives and new research questions. They'll gain new skills and use their expertise in the generation and application of new knowledge. And then they said unforeseen solutions will begin to emerge to many of the problems that seem unsurmountable. 
And for me, my favorite quote of all comes from the late Frank Rose, a wonderful Oakland community leader and partner, who when we asked him, what's your superpower, said, I don't think outside the box, I think outside the warehouse. And to me, when we partner with uh, community members and benefit from their enormous lived experience and listen to their ideas, our opportunities as a partnership for thinking outside the warehouse put us in a much better position to really study and then redress some of the very difficult problems and challenges we face today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Meredith. That was a wonderful overview of these projects and their promise and challenges. I used to hear much more about corner store health food initiatives and grocery store building initiatives and food deserts, but not much on it in years. The only thing I've read recently was about the failed efforts of community foods in West Oakland, which had to close. Are efforts to combat food deserts still popular? Yeah, uh, we've, we've stopped using, uh, we've, we've started differentiating between food deserts and food swamps because some of these neighborhoods, certainly the Tenderloin and Bayview, are swamped with stores that are not helpful. Uh, they're, not, they're not in a food desert, but they're in a healthy food desert. Uh, and so I think that the terminology has been problematic, but I, to your point, uh, it is true that some of the efforts to start uh, full serve grocery stores in these neighborhoods have not worked. Uh, I think this effort to start small, bring the merchants and the residents along with you have the celebration of every store that reopens and work up to getting a full serve grocery store, it's probably more likely to succeed. So I'm, I'm hopeful about this, but good question. Good. Um, so uh, let me ask um, about, um, you mentioned that uh, this time consuming and <laughs> uh, effort consuming, uh, maybe even expensive. Um, so once the grant runs out and you do maintain contact with these people, um, is it coming out of your own hide more or less? Is that what's happened? What's happening for the researchers involved or, um, or do, or is, is the school supporting you or what other sources do, of funds do you have to keep, keep participating? Yeah. Well, those of us at a place like Cal who have uh, tenure track position are very lucky because we continue to get paid provided we're doing our research, teaching and research and service. Um, so I always like to think of this part as a hum. <laughs> so I continue to do other research, but I stay involved with the projects that are, that have ended in terms of financing, but that still are doing very important work and that really benefit from not only uh, academics being present, but also the feeling that in fact, uh, there are people they can go to who want to continue to engage in a long-term way. Uh, and do you have any, uh, so and how about the um, uptake of this type of research by budget committees and things like that? Uh, you know, the, pers the personnel process, the academic personnel process in your school and on the campus, did, did it take a while for this type of thing to be recognized? Is it properly recognized now? It, it took a while. It is recognized now. Uh, several of us who do this kind of work got the Chancellor's Award for uh, service in the or research in the public interest. And that, to me, was the highest honor I could get. I, I really value that. And I think it's, a, it's an example of how this university has come around. And I think most of it, if you look at our main competitors, Michigan and Harvard and uh, uh, I won't say UCLA, but uh, the, you know the big, the big ten schools. Um, most all of them now see this as a legitimate, important approach, and one that makes the university look better. Okay. Um, from Caitlin Crowen, uh, who or what organizations provided the funding for these projects in the Tenderloin in Chinatown? Okay, um, Tenderloin. As I mentioned, we had actually some of the research money came from the UC Office of the President, which has a tobacco related disease uh, prevention program. And that was wonderful to get. Um, typically we get money from 
uh, CDC, NIH, a number of the institutes within NIH will fund and like to fund this kind of research, but also our foundations, which really are much more interested in this often than in the straight hard science. Um, uh, California Endowment is the largest foundation in the state by far, uh, and they have put $10 million, I believe, into this kind of research. Uh, they're, they're firm believers in it. Robert Wood Johnson, Kellogg Foundation. So uh, the funders are out there, both government side and the non-government. How has COVID impacted these community research efforts? How can communities be made to feel safe again to engage with researchers? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. In the Tenderloin, uh, our meetings immediately went online and have not resumed. Some of us would like to resume in public wearing masks, but that community was so hard hit by COVID that they're not anxious to come back to the table. So we have you know, large number of us turn up online once a month and check in and continue to do some of the work. We, we haven't done a, a store conversion recently, although we have I think, two or three planned in the Tenderloin for the next year. And they're doing other kinds of work that can be done away from the neighborhood or the office. What community projects are you working on now or on the, or on the horizon? You know, I'm, I'm very involved with the Tenderloin Corner Store Coalition, that's still my biggest uh, effort. I'm also working with a group called uh, the Safe Return Project in Richmond. Um, they do uh, wonderful work fighting mass incarceration, mostly of Black and Latino men. This is a group of, that was started by formerly incarcerated people who came out of prison and decided that they wanted to change a system where one in uh, 17 white men in 2000, born in 2001, was institutional, ends up in jail or prison, one in six Latinos and one in three black people. So um, their work is, is very important. And the kind of thing I do is not right front and center because I'm not a convicted felon, fortunately, but um, in the background, you know, I help them write up their research and you know, think about where they can get funding and help with funding and that sort of thing. So I'm, I'm uh, being cautious about new projects. I've retired seven years ago and my husband is after me to uh, slow down a little bit, but I love the work. So I'm sure another one will come along and I'll jump on. How are these research topics chosen? Are the members of the communities engaged when deciding which topics are most important to study? I like to work on projects where the community has decided or is in the process of figuring out what they want to study. And it's, it's much uh, easier and I think it's a much more um, appropriate way to go than going in and saying, I have money to study X and I'd like you to help and we'll give you a little payment for doing so. The, uh, I was involved in a NIH funded study of HIV AIDS. This was about late stage diagnosis of HIV AIDS in the uh, black and Latino communities in Oakland that bore the, the greatest brunt of uh, that late stage. And that means, by the way, that you either have full-blown AIDS or you're one year away from having AIDS. So it's a very serious problem. And the uh, NIH wanted to fund the proposal and there were two community groups that partnered with this prestigious uh, academic group but the NIH uh, contacted them and said, there's no way you can do this successfully without using a co more community engaged approach. It's not just having a couple of community organizations. So they called me, asked me to come on board and I did. And we basically went back to the beginning and figured out how can we get community involved in every stage. And it was a very successful project and ended up also getting some additional money for those communities to do some independent studies and, and uh, interventions they wanted to do. Um, Charlotte Nemeth asks, uh, have you developed media allies who might be willing to run a series on the results, uh, for instance, of the Apple map or the healthy stores versus the not so healthy media attention is another incentive as it drives the customers? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you asked that. 
we are so lucky to have right near campus, the Berkeley Media Studies Group, which is one of the best organizations in the country for getting help on getting the word out, getting your policy recommendations out, and uh, getting media visibility. Their uh, constant argument is before you have a media strategy, you need to have a overall strategy for what you want to do. But when you do, you can bring them in and they will help you figure out where do we go from here with the media. Uh, I've tried to cultivate relationships with some people at the Chronicle. Uh, there were two new studies about wage theft that I was interested in following up on because I didn't think they had involved the wage theft ordinance. And sure enough, they have not known about it and they have gone through some other labor law. So that gives us an idea for what that study that project needs to do next in terms of making sure uh, more uh, stores, more communities outside uh, Chinatown know about that law and how easy it is to use. It's uh, clear that involving neighborhood groups are essential into this work. Are there examples of research where they didn't involve community groups? And if so, what were the outcomes? Um, where they did or did not? They did not. Can you? Are there any famous examples of failures? <laughs> In other words, I guess. <laughs> yeah. uh, one of my favorites uh, comes, unfortunately, from UC Berkeley, where a uh, leading social epidemiology, kind of a founder of social epidemiology, and a good friend, um, had gotten a five million dollar government grant to uh, work on uh, eliminating tobacco, doing a big tobacco control. Uh, study and intervention in Richmond, California. Well, my guess is if you ask people even today in Richmond, California, what are your top 10 health concerns? Tobacco and smoking would not be on the list. So he went in, they did good things, but it never took hold. The community ended up angry about it. All this money spent for what? And uh, fortunately, the head of the health department, which had been involved in Contra Costa County, went back into the community and this time said, we want you to find, tell us what you want to do. And then if we can help you, we'll help you develop an intervention to help address your needs. That went on for years. That was very successful. And uh, Dr. Syme, who had done the first study, uh, you know, willingly admitted that that his approach had been wrong and jumped on the bandwagon of uh, participatory approaches to research and practice. I'm wondering, it just occurred to me, was there, is there something we could have done in the pandemic that would have <laughs> made people buy into uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. the proper behavior uh, yeah. more willingly? Yes, I was talking to uh, one of the top people in, who was deployed to COVID, as soon as it hit, she was doing Latino health policy on Alilia Garcia, a wonderful uh, graduate of our doctoral program. And um, they told her, jump into A, uh, jump into COVID, work on that. And what she immediately thought of doing, because she had done this before on other health issues, is hire and train health promoters, you know, community health workers, have them go door to door or have the, uh, the nurses or whoever's going to be giving the shots go door to door with a community member who has the trust of the community. And when they did that and didn't expect people to show up at these giant places to get a shot from who knows who, uh, they did much more, much more success. And I think they have an article now out in the Journal of the American Medical Association. I, I always thought it was strange. I thought at the beginning, when the vaccines came out, I thought the, there was some talk about there would be buses that go around to every neighborhood or something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I don't, yeah, you know, we've, I, done yeah, we've done that for hypertension and for all these other conditions. So right. people are used to it. You could do it that way. Then that's another way. But I think going door to door with a community mm -hmm. member is, is probably the best. Right. Um, Charlene Nemeth asks now, what are some of the big issues where we might want to add our talents or join hands? 
So we got to learn late in life to, to be really practical. It, you know, we sort of think we can preach and pontificate and somehow people will see the light and yeah. kind of, it, we really can be out to lunch. And so, I mean, I, your talk was refreshing and it was wonderful, by the way, first of all, to say, it's just that particularly in retirement, I think a lot about impact of the ideas and I got a taste of it from my book, but that came through influencing people and being able to influence policy within companies or organizations. But you have me really thinking about the importance of local social issues where we could really lend our times. And many of us want to really get very engaged and to get something we can really embrace, not just you know a talk here and there or whatever. And I've just sort of, I just wanted some food for thought. You know, I, I think about what St. Anthony's does with regard to feeding people or getting them showers, for example. I mean, things we don't even think about. And I don't know exactly which ones lend themselves to documentation, which it's really the skill of the researchers is documenting it rather, you know, sometimes not so great at policy. So I just wanted food for thought in terms of there's some issues you're sort of thinking about that seem really important for people to get engaged in, whether you yourself are doing it or not, which might be an opening for some of us who want to join a group. Uh, or to think about it in terms of ourselves and our contacts and yeah. how to be somewhat relevant and meaningful in our old age. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, thank you. That, that clarifies and that those are good examples. Um, I think that the uh, problem with the lack of a pipeline, you know, that they talk about the uh, school to prison pipeline, which for so many of our low income people, is a stronger pipeline than the one from uh, going from high school to college or to a, a well-paying job. So I think that's one thing. There are good interventions trying to do this, particularly in Alameda County. I think uh, you know, reaching out to those folks and seeing if they if they need somebody to help on the research end of things, uh, that's terribly important. Uh, I know people don't normally like to. Think about the opioid epidemic or the, the problem of drug, uh, drug use. Uh, I, that's obviously a huge area that needs tremendous uh, work, both studying what's being done and, and having things done. The opportunity right now with the Linkage Center in San Francisco is a big one. I don't know how much research is going on about the center that takes in people who are actively drug using, tries to engage them with services, tries to find them housing. Uh, it would be very important and fascinating to find out how many are able to get off drugs, stay off drugs, uh, take advantage of the housing and the job links and so forth, and really change their lives. So I think there's a lot of things along those lines. And certainly the, some of the things we tried during the pandemic that are now being ended, like um, not being able to evict people from their homes in the middle of a pandemic. Well, we're still now, we're, we're able to evict people um, and the pandemic's ended, but they're still in poverty. They still don't have work. So, uh, you know, can we, can we follow people and find out what has happened in places where people have not been evicted just because the pandemic came, became a little less uh, serious um, versus those that immediately evicted and stopped looking at folks. I want to thank uh, Meredith very much for this presentation. It was very um, enlightening um, and inspiring in a way that uh, to hear that these things have uh, had the success and that they're still going on. Right, because we often hears about when they first start up, but one doesn't hear so much about the fact that they actually keep going and that they uh, they do have some kind of snowball effect um, in the neighborhood. So in the chat, there are also additional people uh, saying thank you and uh, praising your presentation. So um, in lieu of uh, the applause, which would be normal in, in presence, uh, we all thank you very much. Thank you so much. And our third uh, talk in the series is next Tuesday uh, on uh, Alzheimer um, research uh, from uh, Dr. Uh, Bill Jagost. Uh, so I hope to see many of you there. Uh, goodbye.